York Comic Con and MCM Metaverse. I am Tiffany Smith, and I am so excited to be here with you to discuss The Sandman Returns with the cast and the creators of The Sandman Act 2, presented by DC and Audible. And we're going to get into all of your burning questions around the second act of the adaptation of this beloved novel and into its revolutionary audio performance. Like I said, I am Tiffany Smith, and as many of you know, Audible and DC have joined forces to create the first ever audio production of the New York Times best-selling series, The Sandman, written and executive produced by acclaimed storyteller, Neil Gaiman. It is my pleasure to welcome the mastermind behind the Sandman universe to New York Comic Con, Neil Gaiman. Hello, sir. <laughs> Along with director Dirk Maggs, the voice behind the Lord of Dreams himself, James McAvoy, clapping and cheering for himself. I love it. <laughs> and the voice behind Merv Pumpkinhead, Kevin Smith. How are you guys doing? Hey, Tiff. What do you guys think it is about Morpheus and this story that resonates so well that makes people like Kevin say, like, I got to be a part of this or like me growing up reading it where I'm like, I got to be a part of this check, this conversation. Uh, we can start with you, James. Well, uh, I honestly I think it's Neil's imagination. It's wild and it's not the same thing one week to the next. It's not the same thing one page to the next sometimes. It feels like not just like it's a playground for his imagination, but it ended up that is one thing that it definitely is. It's sort of some just a sort of multifaceted, multicolored palette for his incredible imagination and mind to go ballistic and yet because he's such a good storyteller it's not just a big mess of imagination either you know it's a beautiful and compelling um thing tied together with these characters that you get so into so for me that's what that kept me going was the humongous variety in tones and genres even it's not just one genre you know it's many many things and in character as well leading you all the way through it so so well done neil <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Dirk, what do you think it is about this character in this world that just resonates with so many people? It's, it's a strange mixture. I think James has absolutely hit the nail on the head because it's the variety. And it's the fact that Neil, this incredibly clever thing of choosing a character who was like the host of everything that you can imagine and everything that you can dream. I love the, the, the fact that uh, Lucian's library is full of books that were never published, but, but could have been if the, if the author just lived long enough. And, um, and, and, and it is really, yeah, it's the variety of the thing. The fact that you, you know, in act two, you're, you're, uh, you're in ancient Greece, you're, you're in hell, you're in uh, 19th century San Francisco, first century Rome. I mean, it's just a French revolution, it's everywhere. Um, Kevin, how about for you? What is it about this world that you were like, yes, please sign me up? I think uh, like, I always associate uh, reading Sandman with a time in my life in my uh, early to mid twenties before I did anything before like I made art myself. Um, and it, you know, it's wonderful to consume. Anybody could consume uh, Sandman and find uh, in, enriching uh, subject matter, uh, things that hit close to home and whatnot. But if you're a creative, it's fuel. Not only is it like fun to read and, and enjoyable, it also fuels your, your passions, your fire. I remember I was reading Neil heavily right before I made Clerks, and I've said this to him many times, before I started my creative journey, the last big meal that I ate before I set out was Sandman, was Good Omens, was a lot of Neil's work. So, you know, you don't look at my work and ever once think about Neil Gaiman, but oddly enough, he sustained me for, honestly, the last 27, 28 years of my career. But as you watch someone's, as James pointed out, his imagination, Neil's imagination unfold, your imagination cannot help but unfold as well. And, you know, it, it's creative. The material is so creative, it inspires creativity in others. So not only do I just enjoy it as a well-told story, um, I enjoy it too as fuel for the fire. It makes me want to be a better artist, if that makes sense. Well, and I think that's, for me, it's always been that there's so many different genres that one second you can be reading one section and there's some romance in there and the next section is complete horror and it's gothic and there's just, it, there's so many different layers to it. 
And I literally was listening to part one on Audible last night. And I was like, there was just, it went from literally me being like, this is so fun to me being like, okay, I'm going to turn all the lights on in the house right now. <laughs> Cause I was feeling like, like a little bit creeped out, you know? And I think that's something that's so it's like Kevin was saying, just inspiring for any creative and just for people to really dive into their imagination with this story that you're telling for you, Neil, what is it like hearing, you know, that people are still connecting to this story and are so excited, you know, to have another part of the audible series with all these things going on surrounding this story. For me, I just feel incredibly lucky. Um, And I feel lucky because, you know, Dirk and I have been trying to get Sandman made as an audio, a serialized audio since 1992 um, and failing. And we tried again in around 2012, 2013, 2014, failed again. And the fact that we're now in a world in which Audible um, can actually step up to the plate, can give us something that we don't have to change. It's, you know, I finally got to make the audiobook versions of graphic novels. How weird and wonderful is that? And, And yet it's really, it's so logical. Um, Comics and audio have have been a thing since the 1940s, since the late 30s. You know, Superman got kryptonite from the radio. Um, And I'm pretty sure Jimmy Olsen was a radio creation too, who fed back. Uh, You know, so there's just this level on which we're doing this thing that's very old, but whose time has come. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to change it. We don't have to edit it. We don't have to fix it. Um, You know, I I have in Dirk, I have the finest adapter director that anybody could ever wish for. Um, In James, I have the best Morpheus I could possibly hope for. And, And I also love the fact that I can get all of these, you know, people... And they're doing it because they're Sandman fans. And we're all doing it because we want this thing to exist. We, and because you can find a day here and you can find two days there. And you can make this stuff happen. So Dirk has, you know, we, we get to make these things happen in a way that is astonishing. So that for me is just the, the, the glory of this thing is it's, it's what I would have dreamed of. We're going to take you into the world. You're going to hear amazing acting. You're going to be in a soundscape. We're going to make a movie in your head. Well, and you kind of, you jumped off saying, you know, you just feel really lucky. And I'm someone who totally firmly believes that everything happens at perfect timing and how incredible it is that, you know, you guys tried this a couple of times and knowing that right now was the perfect time for everybody to come together to make this project what it is. And that, you know, I think it's something when everyone's passionate about it, it shows up and you can hear it from everyone who's performing. Um, what, James, what, what is it about, um, maybe Dirk can answer this, but maybe Neil knows this as well, but as somebody trying to get it off the ground, what was it specifically about, maybe it's just the genre, but we made we made Neverwhere, which is of course another of Neil's uh, creations, round about that time that you were trying to get Sandman made the second time. So what is it you think about something like Sandman that didn't seem to click in the minds of executives or financiers or things like that. What is something like Neverwhere did? Because, you know, for me, Sandman is, it's got everything, you know? But um, so it's, it'd be interesting to hear what you, why you think it took till now. Can I just I think- interject quick? James, you've definitely pushed yourself to the top of the list for moderating for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Steady on, mate. You might get a part. You might get a part if I'm lucky. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> right. I, I, when we first started, when we first talked about it, I was making DC comic stuff for the BBC. They just had a spate where they were where they were taking like Superman and Batman and stuff from us, and it was really great because we were able to bring the comics to life. And that's when I was trying to work up this sort of movie feel to the sound of the thing. That there was this immersive element. It was sort of dense but transparent. But um, I think at that time. 
they just didn't know Neil's work. But later on, um, Neil was obviously a force to be reckoned with because I think Neverwhere really, you know, was was a bit of a revelation. It was it was on the it was on a Douglas Adams scale of popularity. Um, but then you've got the sheer scale of Sandman. Neverwhere, at least, was a book. There was kind of a beginning, a middle, and end. You could we did it. What did we do? Six episodes, an hour, and then five halves. I think something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas this time around, yeah, you know, with, with Sandman, look, we, we, the first series was what uh, nearly twelve, uh, nearly eleven hours. Second series is nearly fourteen hours. That's a huge commitment yeah. for a broadcaster. So I think that's really where it was. So I think of it as an overnight success that took 30 years, James, really. <laughs> yeah. We also seem to be in the middle of a, either a, a game renaissance or a sandman renaissance, where it, it, both of mm. these things in my mm. world have always been big. And now kind of the mainstream is, is finding it as well. Yeah. It just, it, it's at quality outs. And it's so nice when like, you know, there's a business full of people and some of those people are lousy and you see some lousy people win sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's nice to see talent, true talent and good people ascend. Maybe also technology uh, has caught up with Neil's imagination at this point. You can show these things or hear these things in a way that we couldn't when, when you were starting in the 90s, right? So true. In fact, the internet's been the saving of it. Seriously, I thought I'd have to get work in the local hardware store about 15 years ago <laughs> things went so quiet yeah. um i want to operate that paint machine that goes dig -a -dig -a -dig -a -dig. but anyway <laughs> but um enough of my private life and my <laughs> frustrations <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh anyway uh but yeah you know it, it this, the internet kind of i mean the bbc has been brilliant and it's kept spoken word audio going and so on but as you said when we we're talking beforehand uh kevin um you know, there's a whole generation in the United States, for example, who really didn't grow up with with spoken word radio. And maybe your parents would talk about, you know, dark shadows or whatever it is. But no, it was a it, it was a kind of a, a dormant medium. And the Internet just shook that up and suddenly people are rediscovering it. And half the fun of this is that um, and one of the kind of secret missions I'm on is to encourage people to make this stuff because you know to lose yourself in a story just with your in your mind it's just such a wonderful wonderful way to to enjoy storytelling i feel that there's so much um there's so much entertainment there's so much information there's so much of that word content uh, that doesn't really demand of you to engage there's so much of it where you're quite passive as uh, either a consumer or an audience member and you can check out of it while still receiving it, kind of. Even movies can be like that sometimes. You watch a bad movie, it's no skin off your nose. You can kind of watch it, kind of get through it, kind of whatever. But there's something about audio drama or audio or spoken word. It's quite like theatre in a way that if you do not pay attention, if you do not engage, um, you kind of lose it. So it can be quite demanding for the listener, but I feel like, I feel like modern audiences, they want to lose themselves. They want to engage. They want to dive in deep. So the more we're asking of them, if the material is good enough and the material is clearly good enough because uh, it's Neil, then you're really asking of them to lean in and, and, and commit. They get rewarded greatly. And I feel like audio does that in a way that, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of like sitting in the pub, talking to your mate and your mate's telling you a story. It's the purest form of storytelling, do you know what I mean? And audio is a little bit like that, where you're like going, oh my God, and all you're doing is listening to what happens next and imagining what that looks like. And you're doing the work and you're engaged in a way that you're not maybe with movies all the time. And when you're listening to something like this, where it is, even though you're not seeing it with your eyes, it's like hitting all of your senses in a way that I think is really exciting for audiences right now. How did you guys figure out this is what's going to go here? This is what's going to go here. Or if there was things that you were like, okay, this is, we're going to have to pull back here a little bit. How hard was that for you and Neil to do? Well, we, I mean, the great thing about working with Audible is that we don't have a slot. You know, if I'm doing a BBC half hour, I've got to do 27 minutes and 30 seconds and that's it. End of. And so, having no need to edit stuff means that we can leave everything in there. And, um, 
And then it's just a case of kind of timing it out. And it's a bit like I'm a, in my other life, I'm a drummer. And if you're a drummer, you have to kind of know where to drop the bombs, where to, where to put a fill in and where to shut the hell up and let the rest of the band take it. And that's kind of like doing Sandman for audio. You've got to know when it's best just to let James do the acting because he's actually quite good at it. Kind of shut stuff up. <laughs> it's a win. It's a win for the Scottish team. Um, hello, hello. hello. Is that my agent? <laughs> yeah, Dirk just said that I'm really good at acting. Can we ask for more money for chapter three? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> look what I did. Oh. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, um, it, it, it's kind of it, it, it's really sort of mundane to say this, but it's kind of organizing the information. That, that Neil has laid down in such a way as to make it appear on the screen of your mind. And, and my, a lot of my time is spent just making sure that everything's got maximum impact and, and the really important bits get, you know, left to tell their own story. That happened a few times on this, you know, scenes between James and Michael Sheen. You know, when you've got two actors of that stature together, you just get out of the way, let them have at it because that's really important neil how hard is it for you when they're kind of when you're trying to figure out like this goes here or if there is something that you're like maybe pull back a little bit here or we need a little bit more something here what's that process like for you what, what's fun for me is i get to wear a bunch of different hats in this um i get to have started everything off and uh dirk gets to see my original script the scripts that I wrote for Sandman, which contained, which are, you know, normally 48, 50, 60 page letters to artists telling them what to draw and describing everything as I go along. So Dirk gets that, which has all of the dialogue and my descriptions and gets to break that down, steal any lines he wants, give them to our narrator to describe things. Um, I then get to read his script. I give him notes and the notes get less and less as time goes on and we get more and more comfortable with what we're doing. Um, and then Dirk sends me into a studio. And in this case, I was in New Zealand, uh, which meant that Dirk's working day started at nine o'clock at night and would finish at about four o'clock in the morning Oof. for him. But for you, Dirk, jumping in to this second part, the second act, was it easier for you to write those narrator scripts or was there something that you learned from that first time through that you're like, this is how we're going to do it or things that, you know, you tweaked along the way in act two? I found it harder, actually. It was more challenging because I think in act one, Neil was telling the telling everybody involved what was going on. There was He had to kind of convey the whole feel of the thing. And so in act two, the, the writers and the, uh, the artists, sorry, um, and the inkers and so on, uh, are much more au fait with the material and with the characters. And so Neil is a little bit less, how should we say, poetic. And I've got to say, I think that the, 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 the narration sessions with Neil on, on the, um, act two were kind of more of a, an exchange of ideas than previously because it kind of really needed a bit of brainstorming between us which we could do on the spot and it's amazing what it's like being in the studio it kind of g's you up it kind of uh, the juices are flowing and um I, and i i think we've ended up in a really good place uh but i would say on the whole it you know um it what is that phrase the difficult second album there's been an aspect of that in some ways, I would say. Especially given that this came out and while I was expecting it to do well, I didn't expect it to be number one on the New York Times audio bestseller list for nine weeks. And, and now it's gone back on and it goes and lives there. Um, you know, we, we weren't expecting this thing. So there is that kind of difficult second album of, <laughs> oh, we just, we made something that went huge. Oh, okay. That's, that's good. James, for you coming back and doing the character again, was, was there, without spoiling anything, because we jump back and forth in time. What was it like for you stepping back into that? And 
the kind of emotional journey that Morpheus and goes through and the growth in this part. He's um, his journey at times is the f- at the forefront and is the sort of driving force of what's happening episode to episode. And then sometimes his journey is very much in the back seat. And I think one of you guys said it earlier on. It's almost like he's he's like the the host. He's like the presenter. Uh, of the the imagine the the imagination session that we're going to be going through this week. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to keep track of it is is quite a feat. Dirk is, if I think Neil just called him a general. He's a general of his forces and his his man his colleagues and all the people that he's employed to do this. But he's also just a general marshalling these different facets of story and character and tone and narrative and sound. And uh, it's incredible what he does. See, he's my guide. He's my audio spirit guide through um, sound manatee. Well, I mean, I, I love the fact that just talking with you guys, you can tell that there's such a good rapport and that there's so much respect between everyone and I think that's something that, again, comes across in the when you're listening to it, because it's like everyone is there because they're amazing at what they're there to do. Um, and this time through, you also brought in some new voices. <laughs> so I want to jump over to Kevin. Last year at New York Comic Con, you were moderating the panel. And this year you got to come in because you talked about, you know, Merv being a favorite character. Talk to us about how that journey happened from moderating to then now being a part of this Audible series. I had no idea one would lead to the other. You know, I was just happy to do the panel and stuff. Uh, but uh, then I got the call and they were like, hey, they want you to do a voice in the Sandman. And I didn't, I, I swear to you, I was like, I bet you it's Mer Pumpkinhead. And they were like, it is Mer Pumpkinhead. <laughs> I was like, There's nothing else I could think of. I, I would ruin everything else. I was like, but that... Yeah. I got a good chance of pulling that off. And, and uh, Dirk was nice enough to like, let me use my voice as opposed to like trying to come up with a character voice or something like that. So he sounds very Jersey, Mer Pumpkinhead, which is how he sounded in my head when I read it years and years and years ago. I love He's that. Perfect. Well, and what is that like for you guys this time through? Because I know I'm sure the first time you had people being like, we want to be a part of this because oh, they're fans. Yeah. How much more did that happen with Act Two coming around and bringing in new actors to work with after the success of the first act? Yeah, a lot, a lot, which is great because it means you've hit a nerve in the in a good way. You've 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 found uh, you've you've found a voice and people can hear themselves in it, and that's absolutely wonderful. And it's you know, it, but the best thing about it is, and there was. Somebody said in a, a piece, you know, that it was um, we did gimmick casting because there were so many names in it. And um, I just quickly said, no, this isn't gimmick casting. This is the best cast we can possibly get. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to make something that's so exceptional and inspiring for other creatives. Um, and part of that process is to get people in who are perfect. And, and we were doing the New York Comic Con with Kevin moderating last year. And I think I put in the chat window to Neil on the Zoom. I said, <laughs> do you think Kevin would play Merv? And Neil said, we can only ask, you know, because I just, I mean, you know, obviously I'm a, I think Kevin's brilliant and a genius of what he does. And I just thought this guy, you know, it, he's made to do this. This is how it sounds. So it was a no brainer to ask him. And and let me just throw in here that we are incredibly lucky in that Dirk knows and has worked with every fine voice actor (laughs) in the UK and a lot around the world. And I have spent 30 years with people saying to me, by the way, just want want to let you know, I'm a huge Sandman fan. Um, Michael Sheen was a Sandman fan. He says Sandman got him through RADA. I'm only going to say, because I think it's really important just looking at us all here. The thing is, we're all fans. I mean, I'm accepting Neil, but I mean, this is the beauty of it. And that's the thing about the cast. They're all fans. And it's just, you know, the best thing in the world that you're going in and you're playing in your favorite box of Lego. Well, and I think that that's something too, where when you're doing voiceover as an actor, either you get to work with the actual actor who's doing the voice or you have an incredible voice director 
director that is like just your spirit guide where you trust yeah. them completely because they're the ones who are hearing the other performances or know where it's going to go. Um, Dirk, do you feel like a pressure when you're doing that, especially with, you know, just the list of the actors that want to be a part of this and then having them in the room being like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what, what James did for <laughs> this stuff. Or... Again, we come back to the fact that everybody kind of comes to this knowing what they want to put in. And in the end, all I have to do is steer, mm -hmm. but I should say that, you know, you get something back. So James is always, James is, James asks really hard questions. Here's the thing. So, but James, James gives you your choices. He comes up with ideas. We discuss it. We come with things. Kevin comes in and we're doing Kevin's session. And suddenly I'm in a whole new world of, because James Morpheus is kind of fairly straight laced. Let's, I mean, to be fair, he is, isn't he? You know, Kevin's got Merv. So, and it's, it's a Jersey move. So he's just off. You, you did a gag line, which has now resulted in Lucy, a Lucian line changing, <laughs> which has then resulted in a bunch of bats flying around Dream's castle, now having a bunch more dialogue than they had before. This, this is a whole knock on effect, <laughs> but, but that, let, let's get back into act two. The, the, the Wait, two I, Kevin, how does that feel? I mean, you know, you've been, you work a lot, you've been in the center, you do your podcast, you do all these things. What is it like for you going in and doing the voiceover for this and then hearing that kind of stuff about the performance and that they're re rewriting stuff in the Sandman universe based off of your improv stuff. Uh, first off, I, I would caution them against that. Uh, <laughs> if what's worked for decades will work going forward. It doesn't need a Kevin Smith touch. I've gotten so much from the Sandman to, to, to know that like anything I've done resulted in any sort of, like uh, uh, ongoing joke or bats flying around in, in part three, you know, obviously lifts my soul. I would say that, you know, I should immediately say as the author is in the room with us, that we do this all very respectfully and we don't mess with the main stuff. This is just the, you know, the dressing around the edge of the, of the picture. So please don't punch me, Neil. Or, or <laughs> yeah, oh. that, can, can you get my agent? Cause no, honestly, um, I'm worried that they're, they're making their own stuff up. Um. <laughs> Kirk Mags, I've never heard of him. So we'll get a little bit into the like difficult stuff, maybe not difficult stuff, but what were some of the difficulties or challenges in adapting act two for you guys? Um, especially after all the expectations coming off of act one. I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, you're, you're dealing with a known quantity now and you have to make sure that you keep the thing moving along. It was the decision to what, what do you keep in in terms of the narration? And in the first episode, you know, Neil lays out his description of each of the endless or the, the six endless that we've met uh, in that first episode. And Neil's got this amazing way of he's got a unique style of narration. Um, uh, and it's just brilliant because you, you kind of hang, he's got this way of just keeping you hanging on as he's going through and it's very deliberate and it's very good because it means that you can, you kind of, you absorb it like a, like a piece of blotting paper. It's, it's very, I'm, I'm trying to, it's sounding not complimentary, but it really is meant as a compliment, Neil, I promise. <laughs> no, there's something, there's something about the way Neil reads things that for me is like the audio equivalent of like <laughs> movies that have the patina or a patina of movies you know what i mean sometimes they're too real and too crisp mm. and i just don't get it but that visual patina or patina yeah brings me in and there's a vocal audio element that somehow turns it from narration into conjuration it's like a frame around it the, just the right frame around the picture you know a picture can be yeah. made or broken by the frame but the other challenge was really when we got to a game of you and we had to do the uh, deal with uh, Wanda, the trans character and her story. And this is a subject which is now much more, you know, in, in, in the forefront of everyone's minds and it has to be handled very carefully. And it was um, there was a, a fair amount of trial and error. We spoke to Glad in um, Los Angeles and, and we were comparing notes with them. We wanted to treat everything with respect. Um, and one of my proudest, I'm very proud of, is the fact that Wanda and Barbie are much more forthright about what they believe in and about how they stand up to bullying and abuse. 
Um, and I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with how that turned out because I've got to say that was the part that was keeping me up nights, thinking how are we going to make this work so that we can tell the story that's there and make sure that everybody gets a fair kind of crack of the whip. And I think we, you know, that that I'm particularly happy with. So yeah, that was the biggest challenge I'd say. About for you, Neil. Um, I, I'd say that was exactly. The biggest challenge um the the we were very lucky that we got to work with glad we got to run the scripts past them we got to talk to them and get their feedback um because you know you're looking at a comic that i wrote in 1989 that had the first trans character um in mainstream comics so you're you're going back a long way and we're going, okay, we still want this to be that comic and that story. And that was a lot of work with me and Dirk and going backwards and forwards on things. And we had long, long conversations and, you know, Dirk would suggest something and I'd scribble on it and send it back. And he'd scribble on it and send it back to me. And then, um, and then, you know, glad looked at what we'd done and went, yeah, we, we really like this. This is good. And that actually gave us, I think, the confidence. Um, but things like, you know, I, I just love the fact that we can get, you know, a trans performer to play a trans character. Well, and kind of jumping off of that and hearing about the characters that we're going to see, can you guys tease anything that um, fans and listeners can expect in Act 3 characters or anything like that? Uh, only that you're going to get a whole lot more Kevin. This is real <laughs> value for money. Gonna, the, what, what is lovely is that in each act, we bring on more characters that you get to fall in love with. Mm -hmm. yeah, and good, then yeah. what happens in act three is a whole lot more. Um, so if you start falling in love with uh, Roger Jean's Orpheus in Act Two, believe me, Act Three will change everything up for you. I just want to say a massive, massive thank you for all of you guys hanging out. I know everybody who's watching this who can't be at New York Comic Con or are at New York Comic Con and listening have enjoyed this conversation nearly as much as I have. Um, thank you guys all again, James and Dirk and Neil and Kevin. Cannot wait to be listening to Act Two, which is available today, right now, exclusively on Audible. I'm Tiffany Smith, and hopefully I'll see you all again soon. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening. Bye. Thank you.